Hello there, Faculty Factory listeners. It's your podcast producer, Casey, just checking in with a little update here. Just want to let you know that as of November 1st, 2023, this podcast that you're listening to has had nearly 82,000 total downloads and YouTube views from listeners in 94 different countries. And the Faculty Factory website, facultyfactory.org, has drawn nearly 40,000 web visits from users in 122 different countries. This is truly an international platform and we want to invite you to be a guest on this show. Our host, Dr. Kimberly Skorupski, makes the experience very engaging, relaxing, and she actually makes it fun. As producer, I'll make the edits, so if you need any edits on the back end, there's no pressure for you to nail it. I can simply make those edits after you record. We just want to hear from you. We want to hear from different faculty around the world so we can all learn from each other. Please reach out if you'd like to be a guest or to nominate someone in our academic medicine community community that you think we need to hear from. You can visit the contact us page on facultyfactory.org to send us a message there or simply contact Dr. Skorupski directly at kskorupski at jhmi.edu. Hello, friends. This is Kim Skorupski, and you're back on the Faculty Factory Podcast. And with me today is Dr. Thomas Kofi Mensa Cujo, or Tom Cujo, as we love him here at Hopkins. Hi, Tom. How's it going, Kim? Glad to be here. All right. So Thomas Cujo, MD, MPH, is our Robert and Jane Meyerhoff Endowed Assistant Professor of Medicine. He's in my division of geriatric medicine and gerontology. I really have a great fondness for Thomas. I've met him years ago when he first came here. He's an Army Reservist, so I think it was you You got called up to serve in Afghanistan recently. It wasn't quite Afghanistan, but oh, where was uh, it? I, I got mobilized to El Paso, Texas. Oh, El Paso. Serving, El Paso. Yes, serving, <laughs> serving troops who were going to Afghanistan. I knew, I knew there was Af- <laughs> Afghanistan in there. And you you are well, left your family and your work, and we're so proud of you. And I'm especially, you know, been watching you in your career because you're doing something near and dear to my heart, which is around social isolation and loneliness. Not that I'm near and dear to my heart is social isolation and loneliness, but as a gerontologist, my and a cur- faculty development career person, my entire career, my mantra has been around building community. So I'm all about building community. And Thomas, you know, my WAGs, Writing Accountability Group, and this Faculty Factory podcast, it's all about my trying to bring people together and build community. So when I first started reading your articles, you've got at least three or four recently, I know, over in Journals of Gerontology, in JAGs, Journal of American Geriatric Society, all about social distancing and isolation and biological markers of loneliness and looking at the National Health and Aging Trend Study or NHATS as we talk about it. I've just really been um, really intrigued and interested in what you're researching and bringing those concepts, social isolation, loneliness in older adults into faculty development and looking at our faculty in general. So I'm super excited to talk with you. Thank you for being here, Thomas. And I'm just going to like turn it over to you. Tell us about your work, how you got interested in this, and what you found in uh, the space of in geriatrics. Yeah. So thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to be here to share more about this work. I think creating spaces that educate and talk about uh, these important concepts would impact o- which impact older adults, but impact people across the life course. Uh, is so, so important. Um, Going back to a comment that you also made about uh, the role of building community. And so I would say that how I got interested in this work is kind of from out of coming from a place where I had good community, uh, thinking about the communities that I grew up in with my grandparents and how those interactions were formative for me. And so when I moved to Baltimore as a fellow, like I had this desire to build community and doing work, of course, uh, focusing my uh, clinical work uh, and then research on older adults, I thought it'd be important to build community uh, with the older adults here in Baltimore. And so uh, early in my early uh, months of being here, I went out into the community. Uh, first, uh, if I remember correctly, it was an eating together program uh, in the Federal Hill area where older adults were coming together. And, and I saw how 
those relationships that they built through this federally subsidized program uh, um, to sub- do support nutrition, how those connections that people had eating together was so important. And then this extended into going out and doing Ask a Doc sessions. And in one of the sessions, I remember pretty vividly uh, here in East Baltimore at a subsidized housing community, the older adults there told me they didn't feel connected to one another. They didn't feel connected to the people in the communities that they originated in. Uh, and that struck me uh, in an important way. And I think it's been one of the things that uh, has motivated uh, my own going work. And so at that time, when I heard that and then reflecting upon the experiences, reflecting upon what I had before me, uh, when I began the research portion of my fellowship, I really sought to really understand how many how is this impacting older people? I hadn't really been exposed much clinically to this being an important issue, but like, who is this like something real that many people are burdened by? And so I went to the data and saw that there was really not, this had really been characterized uh, in the older adults population using nationally available data. And so using the National Health Aging Trend Study or NHATS, I spent the next months and year, uh, uh, my postdoctoral fellowship really uh, characterizing a typology of social isolation, and then trying to identify national uh, prevalence measures of, uh, of social isolation. And so from that work, we found that about one in four older adults are socially isolated. And this work has garnered great attention, uh, has been cited uh, multiple, multiple times, hundreds of times, uh, and has been picked up uh, in the National Academies report and in the popular press uh, uh, as a kind of uh, sound uh, measure for uh, how many older adults are impacted, uh, so much so that the NIH and uh, in the National Institutes of Aging uh, picked it up as well and used that uh, that fact that we found um, in uh, their uh, social isolation and loneliness toolkit. Um, and so that, I would say, kind of really got me started on this journey and has been uh, one in which I've continued to uh, leverage nationally available data and then also uh, community-based projects where we're engaging older adults in the community to try to kind of understand their experience of isolation uh, and try to figure out ways that we can support them in their experience. Oh, Dr. Cujo, I just want to applaud you and thank you so much for share for doing this work, but sharing how this evolved for you. And I I really love how you started this journey going into the community. As a sociologist and trained social scientist, we talk about nothing about us without us. And you perfectly exemplify this work that so often, I think, as academics, we can get into, and and without casting judgment, it makes sense. We're in our computers, we're in our labs, we're in our clinic spaces, and we're analyzing our data, we're taking care of our patients, we're teaching our, our, our learners, and we may not be as in touch with what's happening boots on the ground. And so that's why I think it's so important that we get out. It's kind of like a management principle, management by walking around, but actually being in the community and observing and and living the life and experiencing what people experience on a daily basis. So what I like is how you describe going to the eating together program and, and the ask a docs um, opportunities to notice what's happening. So first of all, to me, that's a great bit of advice for early career faculty members. And I talked to many who were like, I don't even know what should be my research area because I'm doing, you know, hip and knee replacements. I feel like a cog in a wheel. I just replace hips and knees, replace hips. I don't know what, what do I, what do I do and how do I do it? This is one great example of actually get out there wherever the there is and notice and observe and listen and talk and be with people to see what they're experiencing and where their needs and opportunities. So again, I I applaud you for that. I'm not sure if you did that purposely, but I think it's a really um, organic way to establish something that obviously you're meant to do, that it's been great. No, man, I think as uh, you know, I appreciate you pointing that out. And I also say, like, I think as, as a junior faculty member, as in, even as a trainee here, uh, like I think identifying faculty and mentors who will give you space to do some of that and understanding and realizing that uh, for me, it was really important to do that. Uh, but you want to work with people who give you space. It could be some other thing that 
will inform your work, but having and working with people to, uh, that can give you space to kind of do some of that understanding that uh, these things are informative uh, for our work and, and really important. Yeah, that that's a really great shout out to our mentoring, sponsoring, coaching network of teams and people, our peer groups, our tribe, if you will, who will help us um, germinate these ideas and knowing that it's it's an evolutionary process that sometimes uh, these these end up being dead ends or, um, you know, that have to turn around and kind of go backwards. But it's still it's a process of learning. So I think it's I'm reflecting on during COVID when I started volunteering at a local senior center and the nursing home. And I thought, oh, this could be, you know, this is a some, there's a need here. I can develop this. I can go in this direction. And then learning that, oh, Kim, you know, how obnoxious of you to think that this is already being done somewhere, you know? So that's kind of gets to the back of being a scientist of doing a literature review that I thought, oh my gosh, how come there's not a an XYZ with this group? And lo and behold, well, there already is an XYZ. So, but getting out there and noticing um, was important to my education and to identifying needs and gaps. But Back to the social isolation and loneliness, Thomas. Um, you're also reminding me of back in the day when I lived in Chicago. And maybe it is because of that, again, my sociology thing and my oh, my desire for whatever reason to build community. I remember moving way out in the suburbs of Chicago and it was this um, subdivision, a relatively new subdivision, just kind of small-ish, maybe only about 100 homes. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we all all get together the more we get together together and i'm getting this kumbaya vibe but i'm gonna build this group and we're gonna be a tight group out here and i printed out these flyers and i went door to door to door to door and zip zilch zero nada nothing happened and i was so sad and so depressed i thought how come people don't want to you know get on a, an email group together or get together and have a monthly this or or get together and um, have a picnic or share resources and have our dogs play together, kids play together. And it, it really kind of demoralized me. But kind of, the reason I'm telling this story is it gets to sometimes our failures in, in academic medicine and things that we have good intentions and good ideas that never really took off. And not necessarily it's never going to happen, but maybe not now or maybe not in this culture or this environment. And then it's drawing me to the faculty experience, Thomas. As you know, I mentioned to you earlier that my heart is with um, faculty and faculty career and professional development. And I'm sensing that we in faculty development organize, you know, social hours and and peer coaching groups and mentoring groups and promotion groups. And then faculty like don't show up or they're not really biting because they don't have the time. They don't have the space mm -hmm. to do these things. And it's, and I'm noticing and observing that I worry about social isolation and loneliness in our faculty members. So I know I kind of threw a lot at you there, but, you know, failures about initiatives that really don't go any place, doing things to try to bring faculty together that they don't really kind of pan out. And then getting to my suspicion that our faculty themselves also have social isolation and loneliness. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I know with uh, you know, in all things, there's trial and error, and I, I think um, you know where I'm thinking about it in my own work, and I think it is applicable. And uh, as we think of initiatives that can be effective for faculty, I mean, I think aligning things where there's common purpose, where there's common work, and there's common joy that people get. I think these things seeing where the synergies exist uh, and, and trying to align as best as you can, I think facilitates sustainability and, and for some of these things. And so, like, I think readily um, about uh, faculty um, who, you know, maybe uh, thriving or maybe having challenges experience, but like even thinking about when you get the great, you know, good news, about something like, do you have people who are colleagues to share? Of course, you, many of these things you'll share with your family, but um, like, I think having a networks of peers who uh, you feel like you're comfortable and that you, you, you're sharing and you enjoy joys together. I mean, I think it also helps and facilitates if, if you all, if, if there's common projects that people are working on or things that are, or we're moving the field in a, a certain direction, if you're focused on uh, some common areas, I think, uh, the accountability, the writing accountability groups, uh, 
has been one in which that I would say uh, uh, leverage for writing my K um, uh, with we had a you know group of three uh, faculty um, and you know and not only at an institution we had a colleague from another institution and so supporting one another in that process was uh, definitely formative. Um, so I think finding uh, where we can align, uh, you know, the work that we're doing with a, a purpose and that we're working towards something that is bringing yeah. us to enjoy is it, so important. I worry, I do worry about, um, uh, you know, faculty members who don't, aren't readily um, positioned for a variety of reasons, maybe personality, maybe, you know, where they are, their station in life to, you know, go through this journey with other people who want to see them to be successful. And, and and so it's something that I do think we have to be thoughtful about and have to identify it, have to educate people on the the, the impact that uh, loneliness and isolation in this culture can have on you. We know science, team, science is, should be team-based or is optimized when it's team-based. Uh, and so like I, I think we can be being thoughtful about how do we ensure that people, uh, particularly, I would say, coming out of this pandemic times, how do we find ways to um, to nurture connection? How do we find ways to do in-person things, which I think have value? Um, uh, and, and I think institutions are increasingly thinking about this. And I think our own institution um, leveraging opportunities that the institution is funding, like say, for instance, in the winter, this ice skating thing that was done, like going in groups to do those type of things. The upcoming fall festival uh, here at our institution. I know people listen to this podcast from all over, but at our institution, they rent out the zoo. Uh, and so going in groups and these type of things, I think, uh, can nurture the social connection that exists. And I think some of that can translate to opportunities uh, that can advance our careers through uh, research or whatever it might be, education, clinical uh, engagement as faculty. Thomas, I, I heard you say two or provide us with two strategies and the, the and thank you so much. This is great. The first one gets to this idea of leveraging um, social op- opportunities with purpose. And you're making me think of our new promotion accountability groups that faculty members see an opportunity to join like using the WAG model, the right accountability group model, join on a weekly group with a small number of faculty members who are all similarly working on their promotion portfolio. So getting the letter written, getting the CV in proper order. So that kind of serves two purposes. You're you're building um, relationships, you're having an account accountability partners, but maybe new friendships, new um, relationships. And you're doing that while you're achieving something that is meaningful and purposeful for you. So the lesson I'm learning there is I'm I'm thinking of back in the day, you know, eight, maybe 10 years ago when I first came here and in, and the battle cry was all about well-being and burnout and our faculty are, you know, getting burned out and Tate Shanafelt's work. And it's obviously still relevant now. So we in the office of faculty thought we need to, put together events and opportunities for faculty to come together. So we did social hours and happy hours and brunches and after work um, kind of get togethers. And they, they really weren't attended as we had anticipated that they would given burnout and well-being. And then it dawned on us, well, yeah, it's kind of a cost benefit analysis. Faculty say, if I have time on at the end of the day or in the middle of the day, I have so many other things I could be doing that are purposeful and meaningful. And for them, that purpose and meaning meant objectively work, getting work done, you know, closing my patient encounters and analyzing data and and notes and all those real things that choosing to just go to just go to a social event um, lost out. Mm -hmm. So the lesson I've learned, and I think many of us have learned, is that combining that, as you said, leveraging um, opportunities to do, be in community, to to get to know each other, to experience joy in celebrating each other and ourselves as teams and as groups with other um, purposeful activities is mm-hmm. a plus. So getting promoted, getting the grant written, getting the paper written, learning about promotion criteria is good. And the other thing, you know, you're pointing out is institutional supported 
events like in you know in medicine we had the, the soccer we, we had the, well there was a kickball tournament got I know, getting rained out but purposely designing and creating cultures where it's expected and just part of how we do business around here that we do gather together and we do support this we enjoy being with each other that that also creates meaning and a sense of belonging and mm-hmm. a sense of not only is there, do you fit here, but you belong here. So those mm-hmm. things are, yeah, you sure. can't underestimate those. And I think we did lose those during COVID, but you know, you rightly point out opportunities that um, the institution, the leadership has to embed so that it makes it easier for faculty. So it's, we can't just yeah. say, well, get together and do stuff. That's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Too much work. No, and I, I think you know the the accountability models that exist. I'm thinking as as we're talking, like, is there a way to after that period of time to come together to celebrate? Uh, it may be WAGs or promotion accountability groups are coming together virtually these days, but maybe at the end of it, when people have submitted their stuff, there's a way to come together to kind of celebrate. Maybe that is you know kind of the carrot at the end of it. I mean, I think also. As I think about like, OK, I worked with these people, uh, this group of uh, colleagues and friends to get a grant in, got funded. Hey, I need some help getting the accountability moving through the grant. So we're moving. There is the papers <laughs> written. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I think these things feed into themselves. Uh, and I think when you're doing things in connection with people uh, in a consistent manner with purpose, I, I think um I think we're happier. I think we are, um, you know, achieving the outcomes that we want to achieve. Yeah, I, I really, I, I totally agree with you. And I just, my, uh, my heart aches when I, when I talk to faculty who share with me that they're in the clinic, in the operating room, in the lab, um, working twenty four seven, and they're describe what they're describing to me when I ask them what they do, what's their avocation, what is their hobby. They look at me like, "Are you kidding me? Who who has a no, there's no time for a, a hobby or or something fun or joyful or delightful." They they're just that is such um, a void in their lives. And I get that that at certain seasons of our life, you know, we're really nose to the grindstone and deadlines and cranking and really you know pushing hard, and yet. Um, building those patterns and those habits before you know it, it's kind of the blink and, oh my gosh, where did the summer go? Where did the weekend go? Where did my life go? Where did my thirties go? Where did my forties go? That whole uh, cats in the cradle, you know, song. So I, I always am trying to remind faculty members that yes, this is important. And there's a whole other side of life that, what you do is not what you are, is not who you are, you know, what your job is, what your academic title is, what your profession is, that does not describe who you are. And so I think in academic medicine, we easily fall into that, you know, our whole life is just our work. And that's mm-hmm. at, at the expense of the fullness and the richness and the complexity of us as human beings of who we are in, in other places outside of our, our yeah. the grind. For sure. And I think you want to, it's helpful, I think, to work in settings and environments and with people who, uh, who uplift that, like, um, starting meetings, uh, in ways that, um, that kind of help us know who we are, uh, and as people and not just cogs in a wheel doing this different, uh, thing. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, looking for teams and mentors and uh, collaborators that kind of have that idea, I think, helps us as well. Yeah. And it's a great reminder, as you pointed out earlier, you were very blessed to have mentors and with you who gave you space and gave you that freedom and encouraged you, supported you. And I think it's a good reminder in this umbrella of social isolation and loneliness, it is associated with morbidity, mortality. The data show it. It's real. You point out one in four older adults are living and ex- experiencing social isolation and loneliness. Let's, you know, who do we know in our lives right now? Um, maybe not in the in older ages, but right next door to us virtually, um, who because of this pandemic stayed home or has changed the way we work and may also be lonely and feeling isolated and and um 
we can do a lot to try to build community just right where we are in our own little space. Definitely. So I, I think starting proximal is so important. Uh, and then thinking about beyond, thinking in our own lives, uh, how can we connect more meaningfully to the people around us uh, uh, who we may have weak ties with um, uh, uh, and strengthening those ties? I think there's there's great opportunities. And I also would say that I think there's um, the pandemic has increased awareness about this uh, important topic. I think, um, as, you know, listeners may be interested in knowing about the Surgeon General's recent report uh, 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 which I was fortunate to be a reviewer on, but it was our, our it's called our epidemic of loneliness and isolation. And in that report, uh, they call for strengthening social infrastructure and acting like these pro-connection uh, public policies, thinking about how the health sector is in, involved and, and can support assessing and, uh, and connecting people uh, in, in meaningful ways thinking about our digital environments uh, and how they in some uh, in, in some groups may perpetuate isolation and loneliness and how in other groups may be facilitators of it. I think expand in, also expanding our re- the research that exists um, and then this creating this broader uh, culture of connection, which I think we've kind of been talking about. So I wanted yeah. to give a shout out to that work uh, for those who are interested. Thank you. Dr. Thomas Cujo, I really, really just love the work you're doing. I love the the spirit in which you do it. And I think it's so important, not only for our our loved our loved ones in older age, but also for us, you know, younger, we have a lot of lessons to learn here. And you've you've um, given us a lot of thought of things we can do at the micro level at a macro level, institutional level. So yeah, I'll leave the final thought to you, um, to the to the listening audience. Um, anything you'd like to say? Yeah, so just restating the importance of uh, starting proximal, thinking about what existing connections ex- uh, can exist, and, and nurturing those connections. I think is really important uh, in our personal lives and professional lives. So carrying that uh, desire for connection uh, with people uh, on our our work teams. Uh, as well as in our personal lives, this I think gives our lives more meaning and I think success. So, amen. Love it. Thanks so much, Dr. Thomas Cujo, and you for listening to the Faculty Factory podcast. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.